We thank the Lord for the opportunity to be able to bring this message today. Uh, some of you probably know the uh, Lord hindered us last week <coughs> after, after all that rain. One of the big trees out here fell and uh, fell across the driveway and pulled down a, a wire. So we were able, not able to come to the building, but we thank the Lord for Brother Jeff Hill and uh, the work he did in getting the trees out of the way. And uh, also for Brother Bobby Quick that uh, has had uh, uh, the shingles and had not been able to come to record us. So it's a blessing of the Lord to understand and know that, that although those things were put in our way to hinder us at one time, God has removed them and sent us back over here with the same message. So we invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans. The book of Romans, chapter number 1. And we're going to be looking at verse number 20. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Let me start reading with verse 16 to get you into the passage so you can understand how this fits into this context. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The gospel is a powerful agent. It's the most powerful agent ever turned loose on planet Earth. It's, it's amazing when God makes it effectual by his Holy Spirit to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Those who are born again and given faith and, and repentance are able to pass it on to others and God grants those that they preach to or teach or witness to, he grants them a faith as well. That's how the gospel is carried on. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God his wrath is revealed to those who do not receive the gospel in faith and in purity. They hold it, they suppress it in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. The gospel is manifest to mankind. You say well, there's a lot of people who haven't ever heard a gospel message. That may be true as if you're just talking about preaching, but that's not true because the next verse tells you plainly that God has showed it to all men. Listen at Romans 1.20. By the way, the title of our lesson today is Invisible Things Clearly Seen. Invisible Things Clearly Seen. For the invisible things of Him, for the invisible things of God, what this means is... <clears throat> that they, they are not perceived by the senses. Taste, touch, uh, smell, and sight, and so forth. They're not perceived by the, uh, the, the senses, but they are manifest to men. For the invisible things of him, the invisible things of the person and being of God, by the creation of the world, from the creation, are in, by the means of the creation uh, of the world are clearly seen. Stop now and think a minute. The invisible things of the being of God are clearly seen. How can you clearly see invisible things, especially invisible things pertaining to the person and the being and the magnitude and the glory of Almighty God? That's what we want to look at today. <clears throat> Very serious matter. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the invisible things of God by the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Dear soul, everything that is made is made in order to reveal to man the person and being of God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. That's what it's all about. It is to reveal God to you. So I used to wonder, how in the world is God going to judge people 
in, in the darkest con continents of this world who have never heard uh, 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 the gospel preached, never seen a Bible. How's God going to judge them if they've never heard the gospel? And God began to reveal this to me. Every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever lived has had a revelation of the invisible things of God because he makes them to be clearly seen. How? By the creation of the world. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead. There's not a man, woman, boy, or girl can say that they don't believe that God's in absolute control of all things because that is contradictory to the witness of the created order. He said they are understood, uh, even the eternal power and his Godhead, listen, so that they are without excuse. Everything that is in this world reveals God to you, whether you have the ability to perceive it and receive it and understand it or not. It's there. It's that witness. Their line, uh, the psalmist said, is gone out into all the world. That, that is the line of their testimony. Everybody has it. it. In China, they may look up at the sky at night and call the moon some Chinese word that I would never even know what it was, I, and I don't. But it's still the moon. There's somebody over in, uh, in Russia, looks up at the sun, S-U-N, br uh, shining brightly in, in the day, and they got a Russian word for it that I don't know what it is and wouldn't understand if they said it. But it's still the sun. It doesn't matter what they call it. It doesn't matter what their language says it is. It's still that object that God created, and it's still there for the purpose of revealing God. Even his Godhead and his eternal power, listen, and it renders every man, woman, boy, and girl without excuse. You can't say, Lord, you didn't tell me. He did tell you. We just didn't listen. He did tell us. We just did not have the ability to perceive and to understand. What has darkened our understanding? Sin. Sin has darkened our understanding. But God has uh, made a provision for sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We understand that. But he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us. So all you need to do is go to Christ, receive the person of the word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as your payment for sin and as your righteousness, dressed in his righteousness alone, Faultless, I stand before the throne. So I can come to God in a perfect righteousness that I can see in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. That's what it says. Let me read you this verse again. Romans 1.20 For the invisible things of him by means of the creation of the world are clearly seen. It doesn't mean we clearly see the things of the world that are created. It means we can clearly see the, the things of God himself, the invisible things of him, of God, the things that you can't perceive by your senses that cannot be discerned uh, uh, by your senses and perceived by your senses. They are clearly known, dear soul, as God manifests himself to us. Those things are to be seen by faith. And if they are received and believed by faith, then we can clearly see the person of God Almighty. That's what it says. So it doesn't matter if somebody was raised up in the backwoods and lived in a, a, a grass hut or whatever. 
and, and never had a Bible, didn't know how to read, didn't know what letters were. They got the S-U-N in the sky in the day. They got the moon and the stars in the sky at night. They got all kinds of things. Everything in the world is to manifest God. There was a man that, uh, that came to Jesus by night. His name was Nicodemus. He was a leader of the Jews, a ruler of the Jews. What does that mean? Highly skilled in the words of the law. Brilliant man. And the first thing Jesus says to him is, you need to see God by entering into the new birth. No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him, Nicodemus said, bragging on Jesus and trying to get in good with him. Jesus cuts through all that flattery and says, you must be born again. Nicodemus is flabbergasted. Here's a man that's been in school all of his life. He's been in the Jewish uh, schools under the rabbis all of his life. Brilliant man. But here comes the Lord Jesus Christ, born in a stable, had no earthly education. But he perceived the things that were invisible and perceived the things that were of God because he perceived himself to be the manifestation of God. If you have seen me, thou hast seen the Father. So I and the Father are one. So his ability to see those things that were invisible made Nicodemus scratch his head and say, can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb? You say, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. But it was said by one of the most brilliantly educated religionists the world could ever produce. We're in the same mess today. We are sending our young people to Bible colleges and Bible schools, and we're teaching them the natural things and shutting them out from an awareness of the spiritual. We need to shut down these Bible colleges and Bible schools and sit those, send those people to go sit down on the beach under a man that's called of God that may not have any formal education but has the ability to perceive and understand and to declare the spiritual things of God. For the Bible says that we preach those things that are spiritual, that God has shown them unto us. I wish I could find that right quick. Let's see if I can find it. I hate to hold you up like this, but uh, it, I think about verses and I want to, I want, I want to read them unto you. Uh, for we preach not ourselves, 2 Corinthians 4, 5 but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves we preach your servants for Jesus' sake. God hath commanded the light to shine out of the darkness in the, in the created order. He also in the spiritual order has shined in our hearts, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. The S-U-N, so powerful in the sky, never has burned out never will burn out. All the planets revolve around that as the central theme and that which holds the universe together. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the central theme and manifestation of God. In all the created order, whether it be angels or principalities or powers or humans or whatever, revolve around the person of Christ. He is the center of God's revelation. The sun provides its heat and its light. Jesus Christ provides the warmth of God, brings you in and out of the cold darkness of sin, and brings you into the light of the revelation of the glory of God. Listen. He says, verse number 7, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure, the treasure of the revelation of God, in earthen vessels. I'm just a human being that the excellency of the power may be seen to be of God and not of us. Dear soul, we have the word given to us spiritually. It is not a carnal doctrine, the Roman road. Boy, did we ever go wrong when we got into that mess. 
the steps of winning somebody to Jesus, the Roman road. Here's these verses that you give to them in this order, and then if they say yes, then they're saved. Dear soul, they need Jesus. Who are you talking about? The ones that they're, they're trying to win to Christ? Yes, but I'm talking about those who are trying to win them to Christ. They need Jesus. We need to get back to the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. That's what it says in the first chapter, in the first verse of the book of the Revelation. But we go on to try to use the book of the Revelation to get a schedule, to get an end-time doctrine. Well, I'm premillennial. Well, not me. I'm postmillennial. Well, not me. I'm amillennial. We got all these concepts of, of what it should be or what we think it is, and we gather together in little ca camps and little groups of religion, and, and nobody is standing there in the camp of Jesus Christ. We're too smart for that. You are taking this thing by the carnal understanding and not by the spiritual understanding. So we see that these things uh, uh, of him are clearly seen uh, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Listen, verse 21, Romans 1, 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. That's the problem. And when they glorified him not as God, they, they were not thankful anymore to God and became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. Well, we want to give this guy this diploma and shake his hand and, you know, he put his tassel on the other side of his mortar board and we can give him a gown with different, you know, colored ropes and tassels that hang on it and say, well, mm, you know, here he is, Dr. Bottle Stopper. Dear soul, he needs to sit down on the beach somewhere and listen to the gospel being preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That, that's what we need. They become vain in their imagination. Well, what does that do? It darkens their heart. But does that stop them from thinking that they are really something? What's the next verse say? They profess themselves to be wise, but they become fools. What is the bib biblical definition of a fool? The fool has said in his heart, did you finish that verse? There is no God. Professing themselves to be wise, well, we just hired Dr. Bottle Stopper to come to be the pastor of our great church. And we got his parking space marked off out here. Nobody better park in it. That's reserved for the pastor, Dr. So-and-so. This so professing ourselves to be wise, we've become fools. We've changed the glory of the incorruptible, oh, excuse me, uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. And then it says, wherefore God gave them up. If you take the invisible essence of the glory of God that cannot be understood and perceived by logic and reason and natural senses and, change, and, there, and thereby in those things bring him down and make him something that we can receive and perceive and control ourselves, we keep him as a dead Jesus on the cross behind our pulpits. We keep him as a dead Jesus on the cross on our necklaces and, and, and so forth. Dear soul, he's a living Savior. He is your Lord. Most people won't even allow Jesus to be Lord today. Oh, he can't be Lord till we get there and we'll crown him Lord of all. Well, I got news for you. He came here as Lord. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. God's already beat you to it. You need to bow and worship and quit 
acclaiming ourselves as some great muckety-muck when the Bible says we all have sinned and come short. We need realized sinners saved by the grace of God to occupy our pews and our pulpits. <clears throat> they took them out, seven men of good report, filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm, that sounds good. Yep. What was their job? Serving meals, waiting on tables, wiping up the mess that the babies left as they threw their bread out of the high chair and made a mess of things. And, and making sure that, <clears throat> did you get your order right? Yeah. Nobody had anything of their own possessions. They all sold it, everything that they had and gave the money to the apostles. And the apostles had to go to the grocery store and buy everything that they needed to serve all these people and to feed all these people. And what did they require of those that served these people and that waited on tables and took care of these people's hunger they must be righteous men filled with the Holy Ghost how do you like them apples but not us not us we want a ride we call Uber we want some groceries we get online and, and order it up from the grocery store and have them deliver it dear soul listen we've got so far away from God I don't know if it's possible to get this nation back on track to serving God anymore. And she is definitely in a terrible mess. And yet, professing ourselves to be wise, we still got our churches, we still got our bishops, we still got our preachers, we still got all of these people that's walking around in their, you know, royal robes and acting like they're something when God says we're all a bunch of sinners that have come short of the glory of God. Why? Because we can't see the invisible things. Our heart has been darkened. They're, we're vain in our imaginations and our heart, our foolish heart has been darkened. Why? Because we walked away from God and we cannot see the glory of Almighty God. Go back to John chapter 4. The fourth chapter of the book of John. Isn't that where Jesus was dealing with the woman at the well? Yep. That's, it, it is, and he's talking with her. One moment. Oh, this is Jesus, the greatest preacher has ever been. We need thousands of people to come and come into our great arena and come into this great, you know, church that we built with that can seat thousands of people, and he needs to come and preach to all this. We shouldn't make him preach to anything less than all these thousands. One woman. Not just one person, but one woman. And most men look down on having to deal with one woman. And listen what he says. Jesus says unto her in John chapter 4 and verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain in Samaria nor yet at Jerusalem. Nobody believes that. We're going to get back to Jerusalem and build the temple. Jesus said, listen to this. They're not going to worship God in the Samaritan mountain that they considered holy, that the Samaritans did, or in Jerusalem. He says, uh, you shall worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. At that time, the line was coming down through the Jewish race. But the hour cometh, and you better watch out for these next few words, and now is. That means that whatever happened, happened right then when Jesus was talking to that woman at the well. It's not something that's waiting to happen in our future. It's something that happened way back yonder in our past when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. For the hour cometh, and now is. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in Jerusalem, no. In the holy mountain of Samaria, no. In spirit and in truth. Oh. 
And yet, we have just grieved ourselves to death in, in being aggravated that we couldn't get back to our churches, back to those buildings that we call our church. It's not a church. It's the building that the church is supposed to meet in. And when, when, when COVID-19 came in, oh, it's awful. I, I want to get back to this. Listen, we need a fix. We need a religious fix. We are as much drunk on religion as some people are on alcohol. We as much need a fix of our religious practice as some people need a fix of, of cocaine. Dear soul, listen. Not at longitude and latitude in Jerusalem or Samaria, but in spirit and truth. That's what God said. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the person of God, the invisible essence of the glory of God, the one who sits at the right hand of the majesty on high right now, said happened back then 2,000 years ago and now is. Not in Jerusalem. Get it out of your head. And not in Samaria. It's not in longitude and latitude. It's in the condition of the spiritual realm. That's where you see those things that are invisible. For the, for the invisible things of him are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that we are without excuse. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They rather have the temple in Jerusalem than the temple that is of Christ's body. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of everything that God has manifest to us physically. You see the temple in Jerusalem? What happened to it? Burn it down. Does God want it built back up? No, he gave you a better temple the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only his physical body that was formed within the virgin's womb, but also his spiritual body, those who worship God in spirit and truth, we call the church the bride of Christ. That's the new temple. We can't see it. We won't have it. Oh, we got to get back to the church and we got to get back to our routine and we got to get back to our schedule because out front in the, on the road it says, Sunday school, 9.45, it says, preaching hour, 11 o'clock. It said, Wednesday night, prayer service. Those things on that sign out front, painted by a human being and given to him to paint by us, are of more weight than the words that God gave us, and especially the word himself in the beginning, who is God, and became flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 and verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And God's Holy Spirit Word is supposed to become your flesh. His incarnation is a pattern of our regeneration. What is incarnation? It's God coming into human flesh. What is regeneration? It's God coming into our flesh and quickening us and causing us to be born again. That's what he was telling Nicodemus. We know that the art of teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles except God be with him. Nicodemus, he's not a teacher come from God. He's God come to teach. He's the person and being of God. You're looking at this thing altogether wrong. Why? Because religion taught him to do so. Saul of Tarsus, highly educated, much more educated than Nicodemus, sat under a glorious rabbi all of his life, trained up, 
And what did it do? It taught him how to kill Christians. He held the coats of those who were stoning Stephen to death. That's what religion will do. It will teach you to kill those people who are spiritual. Those people who are religious are the most powerful enemies to those people who are spiritual. They will be the ones that will come, out the, come after the spiritual man. Who put Jesus on the cross? The religious gang. Pilate didn't want to do it. I find no fault in him. You're not a friend of Caesar if you don't crucify him. Uh-oh, I guess we better do it then. It was the religious gang. And this so I've, I've, been, I've been trying to preach this gospel since God called me to preach in 1970. 52 years. We've been meeting in this church for 47 years, as a flock for 47 years. What have I learned? The meanest and the most ungodly people that I have ever met I didn't have to go out into the red light district of, of, of the cities. I just had to go to church. Because the Nicodemuses, those who were like Saul of Tarsus, they got religion in them and their, their morality dictates a legal righteousness that you can't measure up to. Because they will always be better than you. A true believer is humbled. He is the one who confesses his sin. Two men went down to the synagogue to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a publican. One is a publican. It was a tax collector, just an old everyday sinner. The publican said, Lord, have mercy on me smote his breast, he knew where the sin was, have mercy on me, a sinner. What did the aloof Pharisee say, these religious people? Lord, I think you ain't like him. Let me tell you what I do. I fast so many times a day, I do this, I go to the synagogue, I say prayers, and I do. Dear soul, it's not by your doing, it's by God's done. What do you mean? It's what Jesus did that provides you with your righteousness. If you have any righteousness at all, Jesus gave it to you. And you have it by imputation. He loaned it to you. He put it into your account. It's not your righteousness in that you came up with it. I didn't come up with my righteousness. I had a righteousness at one time because I was a seven-year baptized, lost church member. But I was great. I was fine. Full of myself. But then the Holy Ghost came and visited me like he did Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Not as dramatic as that, but it was to me. And God made me understand and see, listen, You've been lying to God. You've been lying to yourself. You've been lying to these people at your church. You ain't no more saved than a billy goat. What must I do? Repent and believe the gospel and confess Jesus. And I did. Some of the people at the church didn't like it because they had already counted me as a, you know, a convert. And they had already sent to the associational missionary of my number as one who had been baptized at that time. They had to go back with their eraser and erase it out and say, eh, we won short on what we thought we had. Now he says he wasn't saved. And I wasn't. But dear soul, I was content. I had a righteousness that you couldn't touch because it, it, was, it was me assuming upon God and so the, the publican says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And guess what the Bible said? Jesus said the publican that confessed that he was a sinner went down to his house justified. Didn't say that about the Pharisee. Said it about the publican. 
Jesus Christ came into this world to do what? Save sinners. If you're not a sinner, you're going to hell. Preacher, you're not supposed to talk like that. Well, I don't want your blood on my hands, and I am going to talk like that, and I'm going to tell you that you need to understand if you're not a confessed, realized sinner, you are not at all a candidate for salvation. Because Jesus Christ came to seek and to save one thing, two aspects, whom he seeks, he saves, and whom he saves, he sought. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came into the world. And if you are not a sinner, you do not need a Savior. And if you are not a lost sheep, you do not have a shepherd seeking you. To qualify to have your shepherd seek you, leaving the 90 and 9 and going out into the wilderness to seek that one which was lost, you need to be lost. You say, well, they were all lost. Yeah, but they didn't realize it and wouldn't confess it. You're going to have to be a realized, confessed sinner. That's what it says. So he tells the woman at the well, you, uh, uh, representing the Samaritans, you don't have a revelation of what God is all about. The Jews have had that brought to them. But I want you to understand this. You're not going to worship God in the holy mountain in Samaria, and you're not going to worship God in Jerusalem anymore from this very hour, and now is. Listen, well then, who then can worship God? Good question. John 4, 23. True worshipers, Christ's words, true worshipers, not just these namby-pamby Christian so-called church members on Sunday morning that squeaky clean and don't intend to come back and see them and, 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 bring, and dust the, uh, knock the dust off their Bible again until next Sunday. God's forgotten. Don't need God unless their son runs a fever or somebody in their family has a car wreck and, oh, God, help us. But they don't need God. They got a fire extinguisher, God. They don't need him. They hang him up on the wall unless the fire breaks out. They're not true worshipers. But Jesus Christ said true worshipers. That's what he said. The true worshipers shall worship the Father not at different times, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, and at various places, but in this condition, in spirit and in truth, you're going to have to have the Holy Spirit in you revealing the proper discernment of the truth of God revealed to you. It's the spiritual truth. Nicodemus had truths, but he didn't have the truth. Oh, you couldn't find anything Nicodemus did that would cause the Sanhedrin to call him up on, uh, on, on question and call him up and say, you know, we've got these charges leveled against you. You need to straighten up and fly right. You couldn't do it. The man was squeaky clean according to the law. But the law has never saved a single man. By the law is the knowledge of sin. It's the blood of the Lamb of God alone that can save the soul and wash away my sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So it's in spirit and in truth. Listen, latter part of verse 23 of Romans. Nope. Latter part of verse 23 of John chapter 4. This is Jesus Christ speaking. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Way back yonder. Way back yonder. You got to go back to Genesis chapter 12. God speaks to man, a man named Abram. Not even Abraham yet, just Abram. And God said, Abram, and you know what the first issue of faith was? Get away from your family. Isn't that something? And you'll find over there in the book of Matthew and Luke, 
if man doesn't hate his mother and father in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. If you love in Matthew chapter 10, uh, the sword uh, the Christ falls in the family and says a man that varies against his father and a daughter against her mother-in-law and so forth. If you love your children or your mother or your daddy or your wife or your husband more than me, you cannot be my disciple. That's what Jesus said. Abraham, I mean Abram, yes, get away from your family. Come out here and get away from that, in, in that erroneous influence that is influencing you away from God and come and listen to God himself. I want you to see those things that are invisible about God. How are you going to do that? Abram don't have a Bible. Why? There's not a Moses been born yet to start writing the first five books of the Bible. Abraham, excuse me, Abram don't have a preacher. Well, it said God preached unto him the gospel. What are we going to do? There's not a prayer meeting for him to go to on Wednesday night. Nobody's going to slip a track under his door and tell him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They ain't a track, they ain't a print and press, and they ain't no Lord Jesus Christ yet. How is God going to save Abraham? Same way, same way he saved you if you're saved. The invisible things of God are clearly seen by the things that are made. Look at Genesis 22. And I want to come back to John 4. I still got another verse to read. But go back to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22. How did Abraham get saved? You better find out because in, in God there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. He doesn't change. The way he saved Abraham is the only way he saved everybody in this world. Billy Graham came up with, you know, let's get Johnny and June Cash up here and plank on the guitar and sing and get these people all worked up in their emotions and come down the aisle and we'll get people to read them the Roman road and we'll count them as Christians and we'll get thousands saved. Yeah, I got a problem with that because with just 12 men that got saved, the Bible said they turned the world upside down. Thousands got saved in America and it's, it's still in the mess it's in today. I don't think so. If they were genuinely saved, if 12 turned the world upside down, what would have the thousands have done? We would be in a whole lot better shape if they had genuinely been saved. How does God save sinners? Same way he saved Abraham. Abraham, yes, God spoke to his heart. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. Come out from your father's house. Matthew chapter 10, a man's foe shall be his, they of his own household. God's going to set you at, at odds with your family. You're going to need to come, come to God. But you know what? Church attendance is always really poor and bad on the days of those family reunions that take place among your membership. Well, where are the Smiths or the Joneses or whoever in the church? Well, where are they today? We look. We notice there's a lot of benches that's empty. Where are they? Well, they had a family reunion. Oh, well, that's okay. No, it ain't. That's the first issue of faith. Come out from your family. Come to God. God doesn't save you on the buddy system. God saves you individually, one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Go back to Genesis 22, and I'm fixing to sneeze, I think. And by the way, <laughs> excuse me. I did sneeze. Uh, I forgot my Band-Aid today, a flesh-colored Band-Aid, and this spot you see on my nose is that which I was been telling you about. It's a result of slice biopsy. I've had two. I had to have a second one because they didn't get all the cancer, the first slice. And Lord willing, I'm going back this coming Monday to find out if they did get it all, and if so, do I need to have to have skin taken out from behind my ear and 
grafted onto my nose. So I'm sorry for the black dot on my on my honker, okay? All right, back to Abraham. How'd he get saved? No Bible. But if Romans 1.20 is true, and not if, but since it's true, then there were things that are made that revealed God to him. And if he didn't see those things, he had to go to hell because it would render him inexcusable. They are without excuse. Okay, Genesis 22. Verse 15, this is the, this is, is the time when Abraham has, has taken uh, Isaac up on Mount Moriah, which is Mount Calvary in the New Testament, and he has denied his right with, with Isaac, his son. And by the way, God said in, in Genesis 21, I believe it is, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. If he kills Isaac, he kills his salvation. And God said, kill Isaac. What? You shall have no other gods before me. And do not we make gods out of our children and out of our of spouses and out of our parents? Yes, we do. God said, not going to have it. All right, get back to Abraham. How would you get saved? In Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. Called out of heaven the first time and said, don't kill the boy. You are on the same mountain that I'm going to kill my son. But you don't have to kill yours. But you've got to be willing to. And this soul, he says in verse 16, it said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed. How are you going to prove that? Look at the stars. I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven. And you ever been to the beach, Abraham? Well, yeah, I've been down there. Been to a creek with the sandy shores? Yep. As the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. What was Abraham's Bible? The stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the seashore. I'll rest my case. For the invisible things of him, of the person and being of God, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Abraham, you got a Bible? What's that? Well, it, it, it's, it's a book that God wrote that uh, is put on a printing press. What's a printing press? What is printing? Well, you know, this fellow's going to invent it. Well, he ain't been invented yet himself. How are you going to get Abraham saved? Same way you got saved if you got saved. God reveals himself to you by the things that are made. Nicodemus, you must be born again. What? Didn't have any spirit, and therefore he didn't have the truth. God seeketh true worshipers, and evidently Nicodemus wasn't a true worshiper because he couldn't see God in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. You should have known by everything that the law has said, talking about the earth, moon, stars, and sun, and all this, you should have known that those were things spiritual. That those were things to be understood by the Spirit. Dear soul, we're in a mess. People can't see God anymore. Well, but our churches are packed. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm talking about. We're in a mess. People can't see God anymore. But religion is thriving. Some of these preachers are multimillionaires buying jet planes and paying cash for them because they got so much money 
uh, coming in from religion, but there it's the broad way and it's the whore church. The, it's, it's the harlot church. Don't have any spiritual understanding without any spirit of the revelation of the glory of God they have repudiated and cast off their headship like a, like a daughter casting off her, her daddy's headship and going out into the world to sell herself to get what she can or like a woman casting off her husband's headship and going out into the world and giving herself to get whatever she can uh, by her own way and her own means. That's the harlot church. That's where we are today and few there be that are really going in at the narrow way and the straight gate. But broad is the way and wide is the gate that leadeth unto destruction. That's talking about the church. That's not talking about people down on Skid Row. It's talking about Sunday morning at church entity, at religion, full of religion, full of self-consciousness, but with no consciousness of God whatsoever. But they've got the sun and moon and the stars. they got the stars and they got the sand of the sea. So what does that do? It renders them without excuse. My goodness. What a mess. What a mess. What was Abraham's Bible? Stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. God revealed it to him, and it was enough to bring this holy man into the knowledge of God. Romans chapter 4. I'm going to get back to John 4, Lord willing, in just a little while, if we don't run out of time. How are we doing on time? Well, we've got a few more minutes. Romans chapter 4, verse number 16. Romans 4, 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end for the purpose, the promise may be sure to all the seed, not to that only which was of the Lord, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham. Watch it now. Who is the father of us all? Now those people over there in Israel, they say Abraham is our father. The Palestinians say Abraham is our father. But dear soul, Abraham is the father of the true born-again believers. That's what the Bible said. Abraham, who is the father of us all, Romans 4, 16. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they are. Getting into the spiritual revelation of God. Put the knife to your son Isaac. If I do that, I lose my salvation. Because in Isaac shall thy seed be called. God's going to bring Jesus Christ, the Messiah, in, not through Ishmael, one of Abraham's sons, but through Isaac. Well, who does he want to, want to be put on the cross? Isaac. It's the spiritual man that's always put on the cross. Listen. Abraham, against hope, Romans 4.18, believed in hope. What are you doing, Abraham? Well, I got these two boys saddling the donkeys. Got up before sun up, and I got Isaac up out of bed. Got the sleep out of his eyes and said, let's go to a mountain God's going to show us. What are you going to do there? I'm going to offer sacrifice to God. Well, I see you carrying the torch with the fire. Yep. You got the knife in your scabbard. Yep. Where's the sacrifice? What does Abraham say? He doesn't put his finger on Isaac's nose and say, you're the sacrifice. He said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And he did. For as Abraham and Isaac, God the Father and Son, went up on the Mount went up on Mount Moriah in the Old Testament. God the Father and God the Son went up on Mount Calvary, the same exact mountain in the New Testament, and God provided himself, his own self. That was God that died on that cross. How can God die? I don't know. 
Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. Wonder of wonders, great is the mystery of godliness, God manifest in the flesh. How did it happen? I don't know, but I'm so glad it did. And Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry for what my sin did for you. I can't look at the cross without weeping. I hope you, I hope you do too. Is it just some figment of our religious imagination? Well, we celebrate Easter. How do you do it? Well, my wife colors some cackle berries, and we get out there in the yard and hide them, and then we bring the, the uh, grandchildren out in their new dresses and their new shoes and new, new uh, clean shirt and tie and get them out there and let them find eggs. And there's one prize egg. Really? That's how you do it? You don't know God from third base. Listen, who against hope, Abraham against any hope, he's going to kill him. Believed in hope. He said, I believe in God. He told those young men, y'all stay here at the bottom of this mountain. He said, we will go yonder and worship and we'll come again. Wow. Well, then he wasn't going to kill him. Yes, he was. Then if he understood he was going to kill him and then he did say we're going to come again, he believed in the resurrection. And Jesus said in John 8, 58, 56, somewhere in there, Abraham saw my day and boy was he glad. He didn't see Mount Moriah and Isaac. He saw Mount Calvary and Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ gave him hope in the resurrection of his son Isaac, whom he fully intended to kill. How did he have any revelation of that? He looked at the stars. He looked at the sand of the seashore. Didn't have a Bible. Wasn't no church. There wasn't any TV broadcast, thank God, evangelists, thank God for that. There wasn't any radio broadcast. There wasn't any gospel tracts. There wasn't any Bibles translated in 14,000 different languages and dialects. No, it was just Abraham and God, just like you. If you really got saved, it's just you and God. He's a personal Savior. He's mine, I know. I love him so. Oh, my soul. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. How was that spoken? Look at the stars. Look at the sand on the seashore. The heavens declare the glory of God. Those things that are made manifest him who is invisible. And dear soul, listen, he is, he is not perceived by the senses. It is perceived by faith. He is perceived by faith. We've got to hurry. Our time is getting away from us. And being not weak in faith, there's some things he didn't think about. He considered not his own body and now dead. Man, the man is 100 years old. He can't have any children. He can't produce any seed. And besides that, Sarah, he was 100 years old, and he, never, and he didn't consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. Even if he had had any seed to be able to put into a woman, she wasn't ready to receive it because her womb was dead. Listen, he staggered not at the promise of God through faith, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. How you do it? Well... I trust when I die, God's going to take me to heaven. Got any proof of that? Well, we got out last winter and put these dead bulbs, B-U-L-B-S, in the ground. And look, springtime come, look at those beautiful tulips. We put dead stuff in the ground, but when the spring warmth and rains came, that which looked to be dead came forth. And I believe that since I was dead in trespasses and sins and God saving me was a resurrection. 
He raised me from the dead, spiritually speaking, and I've sit, been sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2, 6. So my, my spiritual resurrection, which is my salvation and regeneration, gives me great hope of my physical resurrection. Can you see it? No. But I can see that tulip bulb. Isn't that something? And being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone, not just for Abraham's sake alone, that it was imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification, this ain't just about Abraham, it's about you. This is the way God always does it. God does not ever do it any differently. Let me hurry and read John chapter 4 and verse number 24. God is a spirit. Do you understand that? I, I understand the word A is not there. It just says God is spirit. And they that worship him, therefore then, they must worship him in spirit and in truth. You can't go to some figment of your imagination. Well, we can't see God. Well, let's help them out. Let's get a crucifix and hang it up on the wall behind us. Let's do stuff and say, let's touch your head and your stomach and your two sides and say, well, that's death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's, that's, we're going to do that. We're going to have physical things. And we're going to have Bibles for the children, and we're going to put pictures in there. Although the first part of our Bible said you shall have no likeness of God whatsoever. But we've got to help these people. You're helping them go to hell. Listen, it's to be by spirit and truth. Lord willing, this second lesson is going to be concerning the new birth. And it's going to be concerning how many times we can see the physical birth in the Bible brought forth people's revelation of a spiritual birth and what they had, uh, what they hoped would happen because of physical birth. Our time is gone. We thank you so much for the opportunity to come to your place of listening. Lord willing, we're going to have an instrumental number by Brother Bobby Quick if we can work it out. We thank the Lord for him, and we trust that you will come back with us and meet with us again on the second lesson on invisible things clearly seen. God bless you.